All right, welcome back to chapter 13. It's future so bright, you gotta wear shades day here at Bonneville, so let's get going. All right, Westward Expansion. Today we'll talk a little bit about Texas independence. And when I mean a little, it's not that much, okay? So if you're from Texas, I'm not gonna do it justice, but it's pretty good. Um, you need to know what happened at the Alamo. This is a very famous historical event, and if you don't know the Alamo, guess what? You're going to learn it right now. We'll talk about the Mexican-American War. The war itself is important, don't get me wrong, but it's really the outcome from the war I want you to know about. What happens, okay? Who wins what? That's what I want you to remember, okay? Mexican-American War, what does the United States gain? Make sure you know that by the end of the day. And then Golden California, obviously that would be a big deal. As always, you can pause this portion if you want to write some more stuff down. Don't forget to take notes. See the little emoji guy in the corner? He's writing, so you should be writing too. Okay, today, how does Texas become part of the United States? It starts as a buffer, Americans move in, and then it's annexed. That's just a fancy word that means added. What was the Mexican-American War? Starts off as a border dispute. Who's wrong, who's right? It's really about the outcome. Okay, that's what I want you to focus on. And then how did the gold rush impact California? It brings in more people and it makes California incredibly valuable. So, look at the map. You've got the United States shown here in red, and they're primarily English and Protestant. And then you've got this orange section, which is Spain, and they're primarily Spanish and Catholic. So just showing you a little bit of different culture. And that's who's, who's here in North America. Okay, so in 1820, the Spanish governor gave Moses Austin a land grant for this area of Texas. But what happens in 1821? Do you remember? Okay. In 1821, Mexico declares independence. And so Stephen Austin pledges allegiance to Mexico. All right? He says, look, it's all good. 
And Mexico says, we'll honor your land grant from Spain and everything's fine. However, who's going to come in down here next to Texas? More Protestants and more slaveholders and Mexico's not going to like that. To be continued. Do you remember our trails that we learned about? Okay. What trail is that? Oregon Trail. What trail is that? Okay. Santa Fe Trail. Don't forget that guy. Okay, good job. So here's a much better drawing than what I just did of all the trails. The two that you'll need to know are the Green Trail, the Oregon Trail, and the Purple Trail, the Santa Fe Trail. Okay. Uh, also, from Utah studies last year, there was a little cutoff that comes down here south of the, of the lake. Here, let me find a better color. Maybe I'll make it white. Will that show up? There we go. What's this little cutoff called? Hastings Cutoff. Don't forget that. So look, Santa Ana becomes a dictator in Mexico. What's a dictator? Basically like a king, a monarch, okay? And so Santa Ana doesn't want to be under a monarchy, creates his own republic, the Republic of Texas. Now Santa Ana is not going to have that, sends the army up there. At the Alamo, they're under siege, so they're surrounded for days. All of the defenders of the Alamo are killed. There's a saying, remember the Alamo. Okay, this is going to spark uh, people. It's like a rallying cry. It's going to, you know, they're martyrs and people around them are going to want to fight. The reason the Alamo arrests our attention and has attracted the attention of generations of Americans ever since it happened is at its core very simple. It's a battle in which everybody dies. Well, the Alamo is an interesting saga um, in American frontier development, American independence, war with our neighboring nation, Mexico. Texas is a province of Mexico, and a rebellious province of Mexico, even before the Americans had arrived. And the Mexican army is coming back to reclaim its territory. Considers that the Americans are there are either invaders if they came to aid the rebellion, or traitors if they were settlers there who had pledged their allegiance to Mexico. And there in this Alamo, the old mission, the Americans hold up. About 100 of them, they get some reinforcements. And the famous people in American history that we know about that's so associated with the Alamo, Davy Crockett and Colonel Travis and Jim Boy. At the Alamo, you have one of these American citizen army, volunteer armies, only 186 some odd guys defending this outpost against an army of thousands, hoping for aid, hoping for rescue, and ultimately recognizing that they're going to be disappointed in their hope of rescue. This is the imagery that most Americans have, that they were overrun by these brutal Mexican forces and killed. Great tragic losses are always more compelling, more dramatic than great victories, in part because they bring us face to face with something that's gonna happen to all of us. We're gonna die. The Alamo, in its day, gave them a moral cause. And so they raced into subsequent battles saying, remember the Alamo. And of course, Texans have been remembering the Alamo ever since. The Alamo is part of American culture, the most widely visited historical site in the state of Texas, and in a sense, kind of an icon in American history of the mid 19th century. All right, so Sam Houston will later capture Santa Ana and forces him to sign a treaty. Legally, they call that duress. You're hot, you have, when you're forced to sign something and it doesn't count when you're forced, you know. Uh, so that's what Santa Ana is gonna say. He's gonna say, I didn't sign over uh, Texas. You made me do it. Anyhow, uh, there's his real name, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. Uh, they want to be annexed by the United States. What does that mean? They want to be added. Okay, so Texas thinks, hey, we're just going to become another state, but there's a problem. What's the debate? Oh, real quick, Lone Star. That's why there's one star on the, um, on the flag. And there's the flag. Because they're a republic of one. They're their own 
their own country at this point. Okay, what's the debate? Free or slave state? Okay, what's the debate? Free or slave state? Remember the Missouri Compromise? Missouri can come in if Maine can come in. Why did they have to balance the power? Because neither side, the North or the South, wants the other side to have too much power in Congress, and then you'll either pass laws promoting or banning slavery. And so there's a debate about slavery. What's the debate? Free or slave state. That's going to keep Texas out of the Union for quite a while. Southerners want another slave state. Northerners did not. So you get no Texas as a state for 10 years. Okay, Polk ran on a platform of adding Texas and Arizona, excuse me, and Oregon, which will balance everything out. What's that called when we want to head west? Manifest destiny. Don't forget that. Okay, good job. Manifest destiny. Excellent. Give me a little happy face for that. Good job. Okay, so we go up there and we make a treaty. Yo, uh... England, you can have north of the line. We'll take southern of the line, south of the line. We feel good. Texas, we annex it. How does Mexico feel? They don't feel good. So here's the Mexican-American War. What's the real boundary line? We, being America, say it's the Rio Grande. Rio Grande. They say, ooh, I'm going to go for it. Nuches? Hopefully I pronounced that right. Please forgive me if I didn't. But you can see it down here, okay? This, which river? This river or this river? Which one's the boundary? Polk puts troops in the disputed area. Make sure you read the primary source that's attached to this. You can even pause the video right now and go read it real quick. Okay. I Hopefully a few of you did that. What happens next? So the American troops are in this disputed area. The Mexican troops attack. Polk says, American blood has spilled on American soil. Is that true? Maybe, maybe not. That's up to you to decide. But I just want you to say there can at least be some sort of debate, okay, whether that's America or not. And so that's going to start the Mexican-American War. All right, real quick, we'll talk, don't worry, we're going to come back to that Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Talk about Fremont real quick important maps and reports of the West. What do you need to know about Charles C. Fremont? One, two, three, important maps and reports of the West. Okay, good. He goes out West and says, yeah, man, this place is great. There's buffalo, you can have a farm, you can have everything you ever wanted. Why aren't you out here? You should be out here. American outpost that today. All right. So this is the Mexican-American War. If you remember back to when we were talking about the Marine Anthem, Halls of Montezuma to the Shores of Tripoli. Remember the Shores of Tripoli, the Barbary Pirates? Okay, this is the Halls of Montezuma part of that song where we're going down into Mexico, okay? And then um, Winfield Scott, you'll hear about him as well when we get to the Civil War. So just remember that name. Okay, outcome of the war. Remember I told you this is why I wanted you to remember. So the outcome of the war is that the United States gains a huge swath of land in this, what they call the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Okay, this is going to be land for all sorts of states. California, Nevada, Utah, parts of Arizona, Colorado, Wyoming, okay, parts of Texas, the whole thing. So this is achieving manifest destiny. Make sure you know what the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is, all right? It is this land over here, okay? All this land, Mexican secession, okay? Very good. So this is just a little review. If you remember your Utah studies, there was something called Order 44, where the Mormons had to leave. Okay, and then they, they go up into Nauvoo, Illinois, and then they decide to leave there, and they're going to head out to a place in the West where they won't bother anyone, and they won't be infringed upon, I should use the actual word, where they will uh, infringe upon no one and be not likely to be infringed upon. Okay, right there, the actual quote. And here you can see their movements. And what I want you to check on this is when they're coming out to, to Salt Lake City, 
which wouldn't have been called Salt Lake City back then, but where Salt Lake City is today, this is Mexico at the time that they're headed out here. So the Mexican-American War, this part of the land, it's going to change hands. What's that treaty where this becomes part of the United States? The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Do you see that? Gold was actually found by Mexicans in the 1830s in a couple different spots, Southern California, but not, not the gold fields that we associate with the gold rush. The Mexicans had no idea, of course, that gold of the amount discovered in the 1850s and 1860s actually existed there. But before California becomes a state, gold is discovered. And it's one of those transforming episodes in the American past. And the rush is on. The gold rush is maybe the classic American story. One of the funny things about the gold rush is that very few people actually made any money from gold itself. In Gold Rush, California, success followed a willingness to try and fail, and try and fail, and try and fail. In New England, where American culture originated, there wasn't a tolerance of failure like this. Failure was equated with sin and with moral failing. In California of the Gold Rush, none of that applied. Everybody understood that luck was as much a factor in success as anything else. The lure of quick money has just had an enormous attraction for the new America at that time. The scramble for mineral wealth, which is extremely ugly. It involves the rape of the countryside, the exploitation of Mexicans, the extermination of local tribes, the mistreatment of Asians who come in as laborers and are also very badly treated in the mines, the terrible loss of life and impoverishment of the people who go out and dig the stuff. This was a signal event that transformed the landscape it transformed the demography of California in the West, and one could argue was a seismic shift in American history of the mid-19th century. Ironically, the great breakthrough of, of the gold rush was not creating fortunes from this precious metal found in the... All right, so we're going to talk about Sutter's Fort real quick. Look at the explosion of people, 14,000 to 100,000 people. Um, and then also look at the immigrants, okay? This is where we're going to get a lot of an influx of Chinese immigrants. I don't know why every history book wants you to know that they were, that they're going to stay in the West and they're going to have Chinese laundry. I mean, I know why, but it's, to me, it's not, it's overemphasized, but just be aware of that. This is what I would emphasize. Boom. They're going to be building the transcontinental railroad in a little bit when we talk about blasting tunnels through the Sierra Nevada these uh, Chinese laborers are going to put their life on the line to make the railroad happen. So that's it for today. Oh, wait. Yep, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this lesson, and we'll see you back here soon.